Yes, we are welcoming our first participants. Very good. Nobody's chatting. Yeah, I see people joining from uh, the US even so early. Well, got up early. Wow. Kind of the usual suspects. Joining 7 a.m. in New York. Yes. London, of course, Middle East. Belgium. Fantastic. Zurich. Amsterdam. Brilliant. Can we start, Joe? I think all yes, people managed of to course. join by now. Yeah? Yeah. Are we um, good to go? All right. Yes. Um, wonderful. OK, great. Um, welcome, everyone, um, to this IPFA FinTech Committee webinar. Um, I'm very pleased to, to, to hear that we've got participants from, from all continents. So uh, good morning, good day, good evening, depending where you are. I'm very excited uh, to welcome you all today to um, this webinar on the topic of tracking payment and trade transactions. Is it a holy grail to full visibility and control? Uh, well, we will, uh, we will certainly learn uh, more about it, uh, about it today. Um, just by way of a very brief introduction, um, my name is Joe Wissing. I'm based with Lloyds Bank in Singapore and I uh, was recently uh, lucky to be elected to, uh, to the IFA board. And I'm very happy to be moderating this webinar today with um, a real panel of, of experts. So, um, and we wanna of course hear from the experts. So I just wanna briefly set the scene for you in terms of like what we're gonna cover today. We'll be, um, we'll be talking about topics such as what actually is, um, is the SWIFT GPI? Which sort of um, innovation have we seen in the payment space? And how is, how is this innovation relevant um, from a trade finance perspective? How can it help, for example, for corporates to gain more visibility on their transactions uh, the same way as the SWIFT GPI has helped to gain more visibility on, on payments? Um, and how, um, but how can banks actually look to, um, to implement um, the, uh, the sort of like the, um, the, the innovation that we've seen in this space within their processes? And, how can that help them? And um, also, of course, which, which challenges have we got to consider at the same time um, when it comes to uh, technical change, which, which of course certainly is, is always a bit challenging. Um, before we dive into all these topics, um, and as I say, we have an expert panel, I would like for, for each of the panelists just to briefly introduce themselves. And um, why don't we go in, in, in order of, of appearance on the screen here and uh, start with your area. For a brief introduction. Eric, you're on mute. You're on mute. Well, sorry about that. Didn't want to bother anyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Eric Bell. I'm the head of a global transaction banking team at a Society Journal in the UK. Thank you, Eric. Marissa, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Marissa, and I lead the trade innovation and solution development team at Lloyds Bank. I've about 15 years in transaction banking, and prior to trade, I was in the cross-border payment space. So this 
webinar is super exciting for me. Brilliant, hey. thank you. Hello everybody, yeah. I'm Kazimir Weisler. I'm a CEO of a Tessellate Group. We're a consulting company and we specialize among other things uh, around corporate banking with strong activities on trade finance, lending and cash management. Fantastic. Mose? Yes, I'm Moshe Wolfson. I'm a global origination lead at TradeStream, and I've been in the trade finance area for about 12 years, and most of my work has been with European banks. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, Andre. Yes, hi Joe. Hi everyone. My name is Andre Kassaman. Since uh, early 2016, I'm Chief Marketing Officer at uh, Intix and working with Joe uh, on the ITFA and, and Marissa on the ITFA committee uh, since about 2018. Glad to be here with you guys. Um, and we're very glad to, to have you, as, as we're very glad to, to have all of you. And um, Thank you very much um, uh, to the panel in advance for, for taking the time to be with us. Um, I would also like to use this occasion actually to, um, to thank um, the ITFA uh, website sponsors, um, London Forfeit and Company, our gold sponsor, as well as Sullivan and Willis Tower Watson, Swiss Re and AIG, our silver website sponsors. Um, really grateful for the, uh, the ongoing support um, of, of our sponsors. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, now, um, delving straight into it, and, and as I said, I, am, I have actually promised uh, that, uh, that we're going to cover a bit more about the, um, the scope of the SWIFT GPI, um, especially I think for the uh, people here that are more from the trade finance background, it will actually be interesting to understand what innovation we've actually already heard in the, uh, in the payment space. Um, so Eric, if you briefly talk us through the, um, through the scope of the SWIFT GPI and how um, at Societe Generale you're, you're utilizing it to the benefit of your clients. Sure, I'll try to be brief because um, SWIFT GPI is one of my favorite topics so I could talk about it for hours but I'll try to be brief I promise. Um, so first of all what is SWIFT GPI? Simple, everybody knows DHL. When you send a package using DHL you get a, a tracking number. And you can go online or you can track physically your parcel to know exactly where it is. Uh, and you know exactly at what time it, was, it arrived to the, the beneficiary and at what time the beneficiary collected the package. So you can track it online. Well, Swift GPI is exactly the same thing, but for payments, okay? So you get a, a reference number, which is called a UETR, unique end-to-end -end reference number. And this transaction reference is going to go across all the different corresponding bank and each corresponding bank is going to send a message to the SWIFT platform to advise all the other banks of the status of the payments. Okay, so you can really track like a metro line, where is your payment and uh, each time you can see the value, uh, the FX rate that was applied, if it's necessary, you can see the fees that have been deducted from each bank, and you can see when the beneficiary has received the money, and you can see when his account has been collected, uh, credited. So really you can track the payment from beginning to the end. Of course, with GPI, it's, um, it's an ecosystem. So it started with uh, the, the classic pay and trace, so tracking your payments, but you have other, um, I would say, ancillary businesses that came with it. Now we are talking about inbound tracking where some corporates can actually know what's going to arrive uh, into their account in advance so that they can forecast and improve their treasury forecasting. You have other uh, applications with Swift GPI, uh, for example, the pre-validation of data on case resolution. So pre-validation of data is when you want to make a payment, um, instead of, well, having a, a, a beacon IBAN and not being sure that the beneficiary you're sending the money to is actually the beneficiary, uh, if you, you go into pre-validation, you will get confirmation that this beacon IBAN is indeed the one uh, for this beneficiary. On case resolution, same principle as the tracker, but when you have a case. So beneficiary claims non-receipt uh, before you were obliged to contact each bank along the chain and waiting for their answer. Tomorrow, you don't have to do that. Uh, really, if there's a a case where some documentation is required in terms of uh, AML or sanctions on embargo requirements, um, all you need to do is to contact directly 
the bank that's holding the funds or having the, the, the answers and they will send you back directly the answers. So it, it helps, it goes faster um, and obviously it helps again to track. So that's the, the basics of Swift GPI. Just for everybody to understand the, the scope, I mean, there are something like 1,000, close to 1,500 banks that are live on Swift GPI today. 70% more than 70% actually, I think we're close to 80% now of payments, cross-border payments are Swift GPI, meaning they are tracked for Swift GPI. And the amount it represents is $355 billion every day. $355 billion of payments every day are tracked by Swift GPI. Okay, so that's huge. The reason why um, Swift GPI was so successful and was such a win-win between banks and corporates is because it is a win-win, okay? The banks so far, when they had a, an investigation, and I'm going to answer the, the second part of the question okay. about Society General, but not only Society General, uh, a bank, when they had a, a case of um, beneficiary claims non receipt, they had to go through all the chain until and get the answers from everyone. Today, you don't have to do that. You log on the Swim GPI tracker, you see exactly where is the payment, you can advise your customer in a few minutes. Even better, customers now have access to the Swim GPI tracker. Okay, so Society General, for example, we give access to the tracker to the customer. They can go online and they can see their payment themselves. They don't need us anymore. So this is where really the, the customer service and, and the service to the customer improved dramatically. It's instead of waiting for a few hours at best, sometimes a few days to know where the funds were, it's almost in real time where the customer can go online and they can see what's, what's the payment, where's the payment, where it's blocked or not. And sometimes the beneficiary may claim is on receipt and actually the funds were received one hour ago. Um, so that's uh, one example. Another example is when you have a, a merger and acquisition or a very sensitive transaction. Very often you have lawyers all around the table and they need confirmation that the funds are on the beneficiary account. Before, it was not that easy because everyone was on the line with their own bank, making sure that the funds were, went through the process. Today, with one screen on the Swift GPI tracker, you see exactly when the funds are in the beneficiary and the transaction can be closed. Uh, very easy. So in terms of client service, in terms of um, improvement for the customer too, uh, because on the corporate side, why was it a win? Well, first of all, they can track the payment. But most of all, some customers are very advanced with Swift GPI, and this is called G4C, so GPI for corporate. It's another part of the uh, GPI ecosystem, where it's actually the customer that initiates themselves the UETR at inception of the payment. So when they launch the payment, they input the UETR themselves in the payment and every message they receive from the bank is fed into the ERP and they can track their payment live with a direct link to the ERP. So that's a very advanced way in Swift GPI, of course. I mean, they are the basic one, you have access to the tracker. The most advanced way is G4C, but depending on the size of the company and what you want to achieve, you can track your payment, and you can really track it, I would say almost in real time. I mean, we're talking about a, a few minutes here. So that's, that's what I, I had to say on my part. I know there are other speakers and there are other questions. I don't know if at this stage there's any question on Swift GPI. I am um, actually, you just reminded me, thank you very much for that, um, Eric. And you just reminded me to actually remind all participants uh, today um, that you're very welcome to uh, ask questions using the chat function on Zoom. Uh, just type your question in there and we'll either go through them as we go through the session respectively, we'll leave some time for Q&A at the end for sure, but just feel free to, to fire away with all your questions um, as and when they spring to mind. Uh, Eric, clearly you've uh, you've explained it so well that um, right now there are no questions. Um, so um, maybe moving moving on to the more technical side then in terms of like the, the, the nitty gritty, what happens in the system. Andre, keen to hear from you how actually the internal transaction tracking then helps maximize that transparency and payment processing. And how does it how does it fit with the Swift GPI? Yes, thank you, Joe, and, and thanks, Eric. Uh, indeed, uh, Eric mentioned DHL, 
in 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 our uh, private life when we get something delivered which happens uh, possibly more and more now uh, with the pandemic uh, we know where uh, the the delivery uh, is uh, how the delivery is, is progressing and that's exactly what uh, swift implemented in correspondent banking so thanks eric for for uh, explaining this to our trade audience today uh, basically i think with gpi there was a, a major market transformation in cross-border payments and uh, the client expectations have just been reset uh, you, you uh, clients now know they can get this uh, increased visibility and uh, I don't think a payments provider could enter the market now without uh, providing uh, that same level of visibility. It has become a new standard. It has increased the use of uh, uh, SWIFT uh, in terms of uh, indeed uh, tracking those payments uh, between the various banks. And that's exactly how you could see it. It's an in institution level tracking that enables to provide more visibility to the clients. And this new uh, way of working is becoming a standard. As Eric said, uh, hundreds of thousands of banks are now using it. Uh, so it has become the new way of working uh, for uh, correspondent banks using SWIFT. And, and I would expect, of course, uh, the new payment operators entering the cross-border payments market like Visa, MasterCard, you know, those card companies are moving into account-to-account -account payments or blockchain companies, cent central bank crypto uh, currencies to also offer a, a, a certain level of uh, visibility in, with regards to payment processing, because that is the baseline now. Now, of course, as uh, the industry has started to offer more visibility on those transactions, they're, they're asking uh, for more. Uh, people, whether talking about corporate clients or internal users, this theme of I want to get transparency, I want to get um, notifications, automatic notifications about the status of my transactions is become really uh, a, a strong uh, priority, a major priority for uh, any, any users, again, whether they are commercial uh, relationships, clients, or internal users. And that's actually where technology now enables to, to go much further, uh, rather than just doing uh, uh, cross-institution uh, tracking of transactions, which only the payment platforms can uh, uh, offer because they're handling those transactions, we talk, whether we're talking Swift, Visa, MasterCard, or, or others in the future. It's important to see that uh, this trend is not stopping there. This trend to, to this quest for more visibility, for more transparency, is more and more requested uh, within uh, the transaction processing that is happening within the institution. And indeed, uh, this is where uh, dedicated transaction tracking systems, and, and I'll come back later for, for, for details on that, uh, enable uh, banks to offer more transparency on those same transactions that are tracked by GPI or other payment platforms and that are going, as we know, through a series of internal systems. And basically this increased visibility is becoming a key requirement uh, for corporate clients, but also for operations people within the bank, compliance people, IT security, business development, all have needs for accessing this data, but not just uh, accessing global analytics, which can be done since uh, uh, years, if not decades, uh, but for tracking really the latest status of a particular transaction and, and to automatically track those transactions in order to see uh, what is uh, coming and, and, and to move into indeed uh, uh, interesting use cases such as uh, automatic notifications when things go wrong or when, when things go right, depending on uh, whether you're talking to operations or, or business people. So tracking is not just a new standard as Swift GPI uh, definitely has uh, a achieved, but it's becoming a, a way for banks to differentiate, to create some competitive differentiation. And, and that's, uh, I, I think, where uh, uh, low hanging fruit uh, value uh, can be delivered by banks across payments, but also uh, want to discuss a bit later today uh, across uh, trade finance uh, flows. Great. Um, thank you very much for that, Andre um, and Eric. Very, very interesting. And um, I, I hope this has already um, helped to educate um, 
uh, people on 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 this um, on this webinar. Um, I now obviously we're very keen to to hear how this really can therefore be finding its sort of like use case within the trade finance world. And um, Marissa, on on that note. Um, very curious to hear from you whether banks could offer similar transparency on trade flows and um, and what from your experience what visibility corporates expect um, on the trade transactions versus uh, their payments transactions definitely joe um, so what's happened in the cross-border payment space over the past few years as andre said and eric and i agree it's been truly transformational uh, in fact in december lois was the fun fact first bank to go live with Swift GPI instance. So that's where Eric explained, this is where we can now track and process inbound cross-border GBP payments in seconds. It's a real game changer. Uh, we already offered FI clients in the past access to faster payment service in the UK for cross-border uh, flows into the UK, but the launch of Swift GPI instant made those transactions visible on what Eric described as this Swift GPI tracker. Um, so I guess the, the, the golden question is, do we have this in, in trade yet? Um, no, we don't have this equivalent of this end-to-end -end tracking solution uh, in, uh, in the trade space. We don't have this UETR, which Eric refers to. Uh, it doesn't yet today ex exist. Um, and I think we can later debate whether or not it should be something that we push for in the trade space. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to show you, and it's in the next slide, um, how Lloyd's made it easier for clients to get visibility on their trade requests, nevertheless. Uh, so in October, we launched, we went live with our trade tracker solution. You see uh, how it looks like on, on a mobile device at the moment. It's same similar um, story as what Eric described with DHL. We like to use the example of ordering pizza, right? Or ordering something online. It, it should be so simple. So in a nutshell, trade tracker, is what we offer our clients to have a track and trace full visibility on where we are with their trade requests. The trade requests, its scope is really broad. This covers guarantees, standby LCs, inward outward collections, import LCs, export LCs, even trade loans, right? And it's at an event level. So when we talk to clients, what they really wanted to, to, to know and the pain point was actually, you know, where are you with what I request? Where are you with my issuance? But and where are you with my amendment, or my presentation, my cancellation? These are events as well. So you have the UETR, a unique reference number that you have on the payment space. We have a unique event ID, which we give to our clients. And it's so super simple, right? It's designed simply on purpose. So there's no need to log in. Um, all they need is that event ID and the transaction type is easiest. One of the products that I, I, I mentioned. Um, and here you get a really quick view. The clients can really quickly self-serve where we are with, with that request. Not just that, oh, we, we received it and then, oh, we finished it, but actually kind of the, the points that go in between as well. Um, and not only do they get the status, they also can click to get further support on their requests, i.e. they can ask for a copy of guarantee. They, it, this is all integrated in our workflow system for, from a customer experience perspective. It is really what we see as a, as a game changer for the interaction between us and our customers. My favorite part of the story though, is, is how we developed the solution. So we never, when we started uh, this kind of earlier last year, we never said we want to develop a tracker solution. We said, hey, actually we want to uh, know what is, we had a hypothesis pain point, which we went and tested and we reshaped with our customers uh, and we kept the customers involved as we designed this. Uh, and that's why you see features like there's no login. It has to be really simple. Um, otherwise, it, the more complicated the process is, then it's, it's hard, you know, I pick up a phone, I call uh, and, and so on. Um, so in terms of do course for, corporates expect more visibility on trade transactions as they do for payments? I think my high level answer is yes, they expect this. And not, not just because they saw it in the payment space with GPI, I think just in general, as you were describing in our daily lives, things have, it have to be really simple, quick, digital, right? They want to self, people want to self-serve and they expect easier way to track, even things like requests, where in trade space, you might think things are complicated, but you know people have high expectations um, as well. And, and that's uh, what we've kind of learned as we, we just discussed it with, with clients. It's a trade tracker is a very simple job to be done. They just want to know, I asked you to do something. Maybe it's an amendment for a guarantee. Where are you with that? Um, so the key benefit is really, it's really the time saver. The nervousness of rolling something out though is, you know, are people going to use it? 
Uh, and I, I'm really delighted to share that this trade tracker tool is currently being used by hundreds, you know, by our customers hundreds of times a week. So it is really being used. It's high traffic, it's API uh, enabled when we built it and so on. And, and we get really good positive feedback from customers. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's it's a quite a good kind of success story, but it's it focuses on mainly the interaction between the corporate and uh, our corporate customer and us. Uh, for for that visibility and tracking. And I think the last thing I want to end with though, is that when we talk to clients and try to understand their pain points, visibility and tracking is just one half of the challenge, right? Yeah, we have to ask, why are they calling and, and chasing on things? The other half of the reason, there's twin needs. It's, it's about improved turnaround times. So they're going to phone and ask for the ones which are most urgent to them. I think Eric gave some really good examples on the payment side certain flows that are really urgent. Um, so when we look at this topic about visibility, it's great, it's one thing, um, but you also have to look at why clients want to check and why they want to chase. It's because something is urgent, um, which is why the tracker doesn't just give you the current status, it helps and make it, it makes it easier for them to follow up with certain actions as well. So I think there's really twin needs. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Marissa. And um, yeah, wearing my, my Lloyd set for one moment, I must say it's really been one of these great pieces um, of, of innovation we've seen over the last 12 months. So um, great to, uh, to see it live. And I always say I, I want to track everything on my mobile phone, ideally one day. Um, certainly as retail customers, we're used to that. Uh, and it's good if we see innovation in that space, in the, in the trade space. Um, Casimir, uh, over to you. Um, I'd be very keen to, to hear from you in terms of like, what are your thoughts uh, in terms of who's going to benefit the most from, um, from sort of like in enhancing technology in this, in this space? Will it be the operations teams? Uh, because uh, maybe they, they, they will be receiving less phone calls respectively. They don't have to chase up customers. Will it be compliance? because it's easiest for them to track now what's going on, will it uh, start to end, or will it actually be the sales teams because they have fantastic new tools that they can offer to, to clients. So I'm keen to hear from you, what, what, who do you think will benefit the most? Um, and also, um, where do you see the technical challenges uh, to be considered in implementing change? Okay, thank you, John. Um, so to answer your question uh, as much as I can, because it's a, a very, very vast subject, um, Maybe we should also, and, and that's what we've seen in the, in the previous people who've been talking here, is um, we've talked about who's, who's going to gain from this in terms of the banking side, but, um, but it's also the corporate clients who are going to gain from this. So we have, to, we have to, to take it into account. And Eric was talking about a win-win situation, and this is really the case. It's um, you know, it bring lots of things, but it brings lots of added value to the clients. And therefore, uh, and therefore, to the banking world also with the client satisfaction. So you know, it's really taking all those into account. Um, uh, then the second thing that we we've seen in our in our consulting services and, and discussing with the banks is that uh, um, these, this this trend to be able to uh, share information, display, make available to the corporate clients is really something that uh, we see more and more of our clients focusing on and looking at ways to be able to, to display and to share this information. So uh, um, there again, this is really something which is, uh, which is uh, up and coming, which is, uh, which is current and which all our clients are looking into. So I'm very happy to see what, uh, what Lloyd has been able to, uh, to bring out to the market. And I think it's very interesting. Um, so uh, there again, it's bringing, bringing information to the client. So it's, it's really client satisfaction. Of course, uh, from our perspective, operations um, will gain from this. Um, we know that uh, corporate clients are calling up uh, operations, asking to know, to track where, where are, they, uh, are, are their trades, what's, what level it is, uh, is it in validation, what's the feedback, is any information missing? So clearly, there's these uh, these interactions, uh, which will uh, which will be clearly simplified and, um, and and minimized with these interactions with the um, with the, the operations teams. Um, as we were saying just previously uh, on the Lloyd's offering, um, less interaction with the operations also means, and that's the 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 the, the world of digitalization. There's less direct interaction, so you have to find a way to keep interacting and to know 
you know, if your clients are satisfied or not, and you don't lose them behind the, behind the screen. So that is really a, a, one of the challenges. Uh, compliance, of course, will, um, will gain from this. Um, there is, uh, from what we see, and, and maybe we'll see it in, in other, other presentations, um, around the compliance side, in this tracking, there's lots of work around uh, artificial, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So there is there kind of a learning curve and investment in terms of time on the compliance teams to, uh, to teach to machines if the machines are going to be behind that. So um, yes, compliance will gain from that, but it's more... Uh, further down the road. Um, and the sales teams, um, there again, it's client satisfaction. So you have more clients uh, providing better offering, better follow-up, uh, and, and clearly that brings, uh, that brings value to the sales teams. Um, in terms of the, the, the challenges to, uh, to tackle this, um, once again, and it's, it's several of the points that were brought up previously, it's um, First of all, tracking is very nice, so you, but we need to know what do we want to track. So um, there can be a mass of information. Are we tracking the payments? Are we tracking the documents? So there has to be some focus in terms of what do you want to track and what do you want to offer to your, to your clients? And you can't do everything in one go. So you have to take it by, um, uh, by, by case by case and to be able to build on that. So it's more, of, you know, be careful not to provide too much information, uh, and I think this was brought up, and to really focus on what is needed, and then to be able to build, to build as you go, your one with product owners, and to bring that uh, to the to the client. Um, the second point is uh, is the underlying data. So everything is, you know, how do I access the data, and what are the challenges around that? And what we've really seen is a, a trend to. Um, providing access through open APIs. Um, open APIs is a very nice concept. Um, it, has to be, uh, it has to be extended, it has to be used, it has to be shared. Um, so um, there's really a need to be able to have access to all this information through these APIs that can be used and that, uh, and that everybody has a common knowledge in terms of the data structure and how to access this data. So we really see through this extension of uh, offerings to access to this information, the need to have interoperability. So to be able to provide this access and to provide the means to have access to all this data and, um, and to be able to build as you go. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Kazimir. And uh, I think there is, there is a few points that we'll come back to um, later on, for sure, yeah, as well. Uh, uh, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and thank you for that. Um, Mose, uh, over to you. Um, keen to hear from you, of course, from a fintech perspective, how you uh, feel that new systems uh, can help to increase visibility on transactions. Um, and what would you recommend to your customers that wish to enhance visibility of, of trade transaction processing? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I must say, uh, personally, I'm very, very excited uh, to be talking about this subject today because I think that something has changed over the past six, nine months. Um, if in the past, uh, there are a lot, at least let's even look at the last three, four years, everybody talked about digitization and for digitization meant something different for everybody. Uh, now with our system, and I'll discuss a bit more what it does, we're actually uh, seeing the results of being uh, not theoretical, but exactly what it does and how it affects and certain things that it affects in the ongoing business in the area that we handle. I think we didn't even envisage that they would have this effects. Um, if you can go to my first slide, I'd be happy, next one, yeah. Okay, in the traditional world of trade finance, and uh, you're all familiar that at least when producing a letter of credit, for example, the bank has the client starts on the left hand side. He has the bank has some e banking portal. He sends in his application. It's processed in a bank a, a trade bank back office system, and then it goes out to a swift message. Um, the next step, which is the shipping of the exporter, who ships his documents, and now he wants to get paid for what he's done based on the letter of credit. All of this process is, as we all know, very much paper based. Um, the document checking that is done is manual. It's error prone. Uh, delayed payments because the way the information has been sent back and forth. And in addition, um, the corporates, 
aren't happy with the service they usually get. Um, today, these things can change. These pain points, when you have a uh, digital trade ecosystem, can completely change the way things are done. And therefore, you see, we've put in the middle our automated document checking system. Because our solution digitizes and it centralizes and automates the whole document checking process. It's not, we validate discrepancies and we perform even sanctions checks. Um, some companies and some banks, they digitize the information with some OCR, but actually they haven't actually done anything with it. They haven't solved the problem, which is checking the documents, etc. We all know that you have a um, tremendous amount of documents, seven, eight, nine documents with each letter of credit, whether it's a commercial invoice, a letter, um, bill of lading, um, et cetera, et cetera. And all these have to be checked and cross-checked. Our system is based on the one hand, a very powerful OCR and artificial intelligence that is able to, first of all, understand all the documents, but also check each of the documents and the information inside against the original letter of credit. We're able to compare it against the UCP 600 and the ISBP rules. We're able to take free text as they appear in sections 46A and 47A in the UNCO terms, understand them and see that they are all comply one with the other. Uh, we also do compliance checking, whether and we have completely integrated Lloyd's Vessels checking or, or um, Refinitiv's World Check or um, other solutions like uh, Acuity's Fercosoft. Um, the solution handles today letter of credits, collections, and open accounts. And what's important for the banks is it's a completely uh, SaaS cloud-based solution, and it can start standalone. All you need is the PDF copies of your documents. So we don't have what banks hate and are worried about long projects, implementation projects, that you have interfaces, etc. Our clients can start standalone, taking the documents that they're handling now manually, reading the PDFs, uploading them. You want to start next week? No problem. You can start and you can start working uh, in, in, a, in a digitized ways, and that's actually doing digitization of what's done. What is, luckily what has happened over the past six, nine months, we have now a lot of live clients. They're very happy with the results. And we see that they're able to process the documents much faster. A process that usually takes two, two and a half, three hours is done in less than 30 minutes. They're much more exact. And that has been proven on every customer that has looked at it. Therefore, they lower the risk of making errors, which is very, very important. And that also uh, improves customer satisfaction because the process is very quick, etc. And those banks who have started doing uh, the process of op improving their operations and um, getting the results, the next step which came rather quickly was, okay, how do we get increased visibility on this process and what's being done? And they want to include the clients in that. They want the ability to send the results of the system and the system gives a very uh, simple discrepancy report. He shows also where the discrepancies are, marks them on the documents, et cetera. They wanna start sharing this information back and forth with the client because then they get much better. The client gets visibility, they get stickiness with the client. The client sees that now they're actually getting a very strong automated system that checks the documents. And at the end of the day, the payments are, pa are processed much faster and the client is therefore much more, much happier. Um, this led to another process and another way of how to use the system and what to do with it. And if you can go to the next slide in this scenario number two. And on this scenario, which came, it, 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 it came from an idea with Nokia uh, uh, and started Standard Charter and SEB and OP. And the idea here is that the document, automated document system does not sit in the bank. It sits at the client. And we're talking big clients like Nokia so when they get the documents and they have to prepare all the documents and send them to the bank, they had system sits on their end. They run the documents through the system. As we all know, corporates are not the experts on doing checking documents and errors and things like that. And therefore they have a system. They also naturally get the digital images and information of the system, but they're able to see all the results. And when they're happy with them, they send them to the bank electronically before they send the documents. And the bank sees the discrepancy reports, they see the, the quality of the information they're getting, and then they get, they give them the okay to forward the, the information from the system to the bank. And naturally, in such a case, the processing is very quickly, they handle the um, payments very quickly. And actually we've built a STP model, which goes from the client, big clients to the, to the back office of the bank. Um, and even banks who, 
um, don't want to yet start doing it internally for all different types of reasons. They're doing SWIFT 2021, 20, 2022, 20, 23, and they're doing upgrades with back office systems and things that actually don't give them savings or lower their risk. But they are have jumped on the bag wagon and said, look, we want to work with you. We have some big clients. We'd like to work with you uh, and do that and, and work together with you. And again, um, what happens as a result is once you start doing this, then both the banks and the corporates want BI. They want to get information to see who they're actually, what actually, how the process have improved, what they're doing. Naturally, corporates sometimes say, you know, we're working with the two or three banks. We're doing this now completely automated, digitized, and the service is much better. And they prefer working with those banks because they get paid much quicker. There's a stickiness with the client and there's very high uh, satisfaction. So in general, the um, digitizing of trade document, trade document checking, it brings major benefits for all players. I have no doubt that just with the changes we've seen, for example, the corp, the new scenario that we now have, and again, the corporates love it. Every time we go to a corporate, we do a demo. They said, fine, we want to start a pilot immediately. As we all know, corporates are very into digitization. They're very flexible. Anything that improves their uh, cost revenue, their services, etc., are very important for them. And I think as we move down in the next few months, et cetera, we're gonna see a different, a different, even additional scenarios of how when you actually do automated document checking, you actually take a paper-based solution and you completely automate it and digitize it for the uh, advantages of both the corporate and the bank. I think we'll see more, more uh, scenarios like this of how it actually can be done and how it exactly is good for both parties. That's it. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Mose. Um, very, um, very interesting to hear. And certainly, um, yeah, I, I think we all wish for, as practitioners, we all wish for less paper in trade finance, which still seems to be a major challenge. Um, just a quick reminder to, to our audience today that you can ask questions via the chat function um, and we will, uh, we will address them at the end of this session. Um, so, and therefore, in order to, to leave us some time to do that, let's swiftly move on to um, actually, well, the, the, the sort of like the, the meaty bit, which is the implementation, um, because uh, certainly we've already spoken about it quite a bit now, uh, the, the last thing a bank wants is, uh, is a very long-winded sort of like implementation into all systems uh, or sticking another system onto an existing system, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, therefore, I mean, Andre, you obviously you, you work a lot with, with financial institutions, so keen to hear your thoughts on how you believe banks can deliver new value from sort of like off the shelf use cases. And, and is that actually technically manageable with, with minimum impact to the existing systems and channels? Yes, Joe, happy to, to share a few uh, off the shelf use cases across payments and trade. But before doing that, I'd like to connect the dots between what Eric said and what uh, Moshe said. Uh, and I could comment on, on what Casimir said as well and Marissa, of course. Uh, but uh, we see a, a, something happening here in payments and trade whereby initially the goal was to provide more visibility. And, and that's, of course, uh, has been done. Uh, certainly in payments and is, is being done more and more. Marissa showed it in, 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 in trade. Uh, visibility on transactions uh, to uh, uh, indeed help the client uh, know where things are. Uh, but more and more, Eric said, uh, we have now developed a pre-validation of data uh, on, on some particular uh, uh, fields like uh, account number. And, and Moshe said, uh, we have uh, corporates doing pre-validation of documents. So the visibility use case is expanding quickly into a control use case. The, the corporates want to be more in control. They're using the data to avoid sending information that could be wrong because you send information to a beneficiary that doesn't exist. It's going to take days, if not weeks, to get sorted. And it's going to uh, create costs all over the place. Same on the trade side. So indeed, the debate we're having is to provide more, more data initially. First step, low-hanging fruit, access to transactions transaction data, and it could be payment, trade, uh, status of document processing, as Moshe has shown. And, and quickly, we evolve into using that data to enable the corporate to do uh, more uh, uh, things uh, by himself uh, or herself in terms of pre-validation of uh, transaction data. So uh, it's, that's why I think the, the, the holy grail, as we uh, uh, put it in the title, 
with the panel team is about visibility and, and control, how to use that data to provide more visibility, but also to enable new, new functions. And that's exactly also what I want to, to share now in terms of implementation. Definitely uh, with uh, technology, everything is possible now. Technology is never an issue. Uh, technology can do uh, about uh, everything and anything uh, these days. And, but of course it has to be done with minimum impact to the existing systems and, and, and channels. There is no way banks will leave SWIFT to get uh, more visibility. You can do that on SWIFT with GPI. And uh, similarly for internal tracking, you can do that within your own system as well. So three use cases I'd like to share now and uh, uh, we, we, we're zooming here on a payments use case. And we know, Marisa has uh, said it, uh, payments uh, are, are not just SWIFT uh, for cross-border level. At domestic level, you have a, a lot of different systems, clearing systems. So I couldn't uh, paste all the logos of all possible systems. There are dozens uh, around the world and multiple per country even, uh, certainly with the uptake of instant payment. So payment tracking, uh, within the institution has to be done across all of those possible channels. Uh, and I'm watching uh, the moves of uh, uh, the logos you see on the right-hand side, the new entrants, uh, and of course they are focusing on tracking as well. Uh, and uh, this is what banks uh, are uh, having to uh, take care of uh, more and more uh, in terms of uh, more channels, more platforms, uh, and take, for instance, innovative uh, platforms like P27 in the Nordic also popping up at regional level. So it's cross-border level, regional level, domestic level. The, the purpose with technology is to enable tracking without changing what is working. And that's definitely what we see with Joe and Marissa in the FinTech committee. All of those FinTechs and including Intix are bringing a possibility to add value without changing what is working. Whether you have a, a vendor for e-banking, a middleware, a, a payment a screening tool, a payments back office from the one or the other vendor, all of that has to remain in place. And the payment tracking that uh, Intix add on top of it will actually help you uh, deliver this uh, visibility on the internal processing, uh, whether GPI is used or not, or whether a, a MasterCard or a Visa uh, GPI-like function, tracking function is uh, enabled on those platforms or not. All of those uh, events happening on a particular payment transaction have to be tracked by uh, a particular a dedicated tool that is not impacting the transactional chain because that is critical that has been implemented over the years and very uh, costly way there's no need to change that with technology uh, certainly the one offered by Intix the end-to-end -end tracking within the organization can be achieved as Casimir said there is no uh, giving visibility clients has to be done carefully uh, you don't want to share all the data you have. Uh, the visibility for clients can be very different to the visibility you need to offer to operations people who are under uh, immense pressure, certainly with real-time payments, to get the, the payments cleared uh, as, as per the uh, uh, service level agreements. And, and we those are counted in now in, in seconds with instant payments. Compliance people need access to data. IT security wants to be sure there is no tampering with the data and no second uh, bank, central bank of Bangladesh issue happening. So uh, tra tracking the, the, the whole transaction from a, uh, an IT security is important as well and has to be done in, in real time. And business development, of course, uh, salespeople are always interested in knowing what is happening, uh, more from a trend analysis, from a client analysis and analytics uh, across, across uh, uh, those uh, payment flows are always interesting for them as well. Maybe less time sensitive as it is the case for IT security and operations, but also uh, very interesting to see how client behaviors evolve and moving from some types of payment instructions to uh, new payments instruments. So that has been a, a very interesting journey over the last five years uh, for me at Intix to see how uh, tracking has been a major theme, not only at a cross-border uh, SWIFT level, but also for institutions at uh, um, uh, internal level. And I think uh, with what we have seen, uh, uh, 
from uh, Marisa's Maris, Mar presentation and what we see uh, in the industry as well. Uh, on the trade side now, if we replicate the same logic on the trade side, we see specialized systems addressing particular value propositions as Moshe has uh, explained on the trade stream side to check documents. But the digitization of that process also offers an opportunity to offer more visibility to the clients. And uh, that visibility is part of a, a longer chain of events um, uh, because it's only one step of the whole uh, trade process. And again, that kind of uh, end-to-end -end internal tracking system that Intix provides uh, is also more and more of interest to trade banks that want to offer indeed the end-to-end -end visibility to their clients and as well as to their operations, business development and uh, compliance uh, teams uh, mainly. The logic on trade is a bit uh, different than in payments in, in terms of uh, lower volumes potentially, but uh, certainly uh, the value of the information is uh, uh, of interest to the business development uh, teams within the banks because during the, the trade transaction life cycle, there are upselling opportunities like uh, uh, discounting an, LC, uh, uh, an LC, for instance. And uh, this is where the tracking of the transactions during weeks on trade, whereas on payments, it is done mainly during the day or during the hour or, or during the minutes for instant payments. But on the trade side, during the whole, uh, the number of weeks or months that the transactions evolve, uh, there are opportunities for salespeople to uh, get insights on the status of the transaction and the upselling opportunities those uh, offer. So. Indeed, the industry is missing a, U, a UTR, uh, a unique end-to-end uh, -end transaction reference. I think that's how uh, Swift called it, uh, if I understood well, uh, Eric, UETR, um, to enable to track across institutions. Uh, we'll see whether Swift wants to go into that space or not. Uh, we can debate that a bit later, but definitely at transaction level, uh, transaction uh, tracking uh, those flows is already possible, uh, whether there is a, a GPI for trade or, or not. So ultimately, the client wants a, a, a synchronized visibility across uh, payments and trade, and uh, all of those events happening on, on transactions, uh, whether they are handled by the one system or the other system, uh, whether the bank wants to track uh, 12 interception points or, or, or or 50, uh, all of that is achieved uh, by uh, uh, index, which can indeed uh, act as your internal uh, uh, transaction tracking system in the same way as you would use uh, Google, basically on the internet to track what is happening, uh, to, to access uh, information, but also to track and, and, and raise alerts when uh, needed on particular uh, events. So in terms of, um, uh, implementation, definitely it's uh, achievable across payments and trade. It's definitely achievable in a cost-effective way, Joe, uh, because there is no need to change what is working. And uh, we are adding value on top of the existing rails and opening up to future rails uh, as well. Fantastic. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, certainly a lot covered in there uh, and uh, and a few things where I've uh, taken note to uh, to come back to you uh, again as well with some questions later on. Um, I would love to hear from Casimir again actually um, and uh, would love to hear from, from you Casimir uh, what you would recommend to clients uh, to deliver short-term uh, value. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, so I'll just give you a few insights and um, what I'm going to cover, it's not really rocket science, it's just putting in back in some fundamentals so that uh, uh, everybody doesn't get overexcited in terms of these, uh, these implementations. Uh, the first thing um, I would say is don't get overwhelmed, overexcited by the technology, um, especially in the trade finance area. There's been lots of uh, uh, work and, uh, and, and, and uh, opportunities around blockchain, uh, DLT, and all the underlying things. But um, most of all, what you need to focus on is not the technology, but what does it bring in terms of value to you? So what is the business value of what you want to, to implement? That is the first step. Uh, 
Then in terms of getting short-term value, um, what our recommendation is there again, work on an MVP. So start small and then grow around that. There are lots of things, lots of new things coming into the market, lots of new possibilities. And there again, you can get uh, overwhelmed and over enthusiastic in terms of trying to go too fast and implementing all these. So it's really look at the short term value, look at the MVP, start small, grow around that. Uh, and, and, and then you can, you can grow around that. Um, to do this MVP, uh, what I talked about previously, the underlying data. So there again, it's identifying the data you want to work on, uh, that it, it corresponds to your needs, that you can access it, that you have the APIs to get to it, that you have the teams, internal teams, that you're working with your, your CDOs to be able to identify and char characterize all these. And, and there again, to focus on what data you want to manage through this process. So it's the data and the people who know the data within your, within your company. And the last point coming back to this, coming back to the fact that, as I was saying at the beginning, there are many uh, fintechs, capabilities, opportunities on the market. So focus on what you want to do, focus on the smaller part, but also think in terms of interoperability. The market is there with all these fintech capabilities corresponding to very specific needs and the banks need and want to reach out to these, but you also need to make sure that you can work and, and integrate all these as you go along. So you need to think both in terms of these functionalities, but also how is it going to work more globally with all the different systems I want to interact with. So start small, build around that, but think in terms of interoperability. Great. Thank you very much, Casimir. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I think that's one of the big pain points of the industry is certainly that uh, there is, of course, a lot of different solutions out there, um, but you need, need to enable that interoperability um, for sure, which I think is, is going to be one of the, um, one of the challenges we'll, we'll have to look at for sure um, as we move through this process of, um, of really sort of like in, enhancing the uh, the trade finance space and innovation in the trade space. Um, I'm very conscious of time and we will certainly overrun, um, which I hope uh, will, will mean for participants uh, that they can still um, stay with us um, because I'm uh, very curious again to go back actually um, to the banks and, um, and yeah, just to get some more thoughts and feedback from, from both you, uh, Marissa and Eric, um, on your experience and how you think um, this this can be relevant for um, for your clients, and we touched upon all these points already, so we probably don't have to spend too much time on them. But um, just throwing the first question out there to um, to uh, to both of you, um, uh, what what are your thoughts on uh, corporate customers' expectations in in terms of increased transparency on trade flows? Maybe I'll start there. Um, so it covered a, a quite a bit about how we can already do, do that, I guess, with, with the information we have. And I just wanted to consider if, if you extend that, right? Do, do we think, uh, are there further uh, benefits that we can give to our client, clients if we can bring in other parties as well? So this concept of this UETR and, and would it work for trade? I think that potentially there could be some use cases, maybe in indirect guarantees. Uh, however, we really have to go back to the, the pain point and the challenge um, as well um, on, you know, should, should trade, not, trade finance follow the example of, of payments and not just do tracking between us and, and our clients, but opening it up to the wider because that's going to be quite a massive project. If I may add to, to Marisa, um, I think we need to, to remember the underlying uh, change. Uh, what's happening is that the digital transformation that took place um, in the consumer space, us as uh, users of uh, platforms uh, on the, our iPhones and things like that, corporates now expect the same thing. They want the same level of, if I may say, user friendliness, the same level of 24-7, uh, the same level of real time, et cetera, et cetera. So all this is pushing all the stakeholders, actually, corporate, banks, uh, Swift, uh, any, any platform, to deliver a much more integrated system 
Um, we spoke, uh, there was a, a lot of, um, many times the word interoperability was said. And yes, uh, we swift on the move to ISO 2022, which is uh, a move to interoperability, it will take place. All the real-time uh, uh, faster, uh, faster payment, that all the real-time schemes in the world are based on XML messages. Uh, what I know, the, the one I know anyway. And progressively, there's going to be a, a more harmonized, a more interoperable system so that payments, but perhaps other type of messages can be shared uh, in more, um, I mean, uh, real time and uh, in, in user friendly fashion. Yeah, and I, I've been talking about, you know, ISO, ISO uh, standards and what about the trade environment that is also up for quite a big debate, I think. There's differences in opinions, even across regions, <laughs> what the UK, you know, parties banks think versus the US and so on. So that's a really interesting topic as well. It's, it's, these are all sorts of things to consider. It sounds conceptually as a good idea. Oh, let's just have this, you know, UETR, you have it in cross-border payments, let's put it into trade. It's definitely not as easy as it sounds. If you take the Lloyds Bank example, all we did is build a trade tracker just to tell our clients where we were with, with you know, at each step of what we did for them. Even that we had to do an internal exercise to make sure our internal, how we call different statuses, what does it make, you know, how do we call that to the client as well? It has to be, make sense to the client and all, all of that, if you want, really wanted to extend it to, you know, a multi-bank level, you need that kind of standardization of definitions and so on. And I have a question to, to Eric, you know, how much did the industry spend to actually get Swift GPI up and running for payments? It, it must not have been a small, a small effort. You're correct. You're correct. Um, it's not a small effort. Um, However, as I said at the beginning, it's a win-win. And, and straight away, banks and corporates understood it was a win-win. Uh, and actually, where it really becomes, a, I would say, a standard, and I think it's Andre who mentioned standard, it's with a new uh, Swift release uh, that was developed uh, and launched in November last year, a universal confirmation. So what I said about the tracker is that each bank was giving the information. But if some banks were not part of the GPI tracker, you had a blank. Okay, so for some bank or some banks, you didn't know where it was. Now the beneficiary bank, whoever it is, has the obligation and it's part of their SWIFT, uh, I would say standards, to send within 48 hours a confirmation that the payment has reached the beneficiary. So now the SWIFT GPI tracker is always completed. There's no blank anymore, finish. So um, I think it's step by step, but you're right. Everything costs money. And the devil is in the detail. I think you're perfectly right. On a payment, it's, it's, I would almost say simple because it goes from one point to another. On the trade thing, it's much more complex because we are dealing with documents. How do you, how do you put a UETR on a document? That's completely different. So you could have a reference of a trade transaction. You could have a tracking system of a trade transaction, a little bit like your system, um, but how do you explain the status of a documentation? How do you say that this document is not compliant on why um, in a tracker? That looks much more difficult. So this part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, if, I mean, if we look at what Swift had, to, I think this was a, a question, it was up for debate maybe 18 months or so ago, right? Should, should we go with this Swift GPI for, for trade and so on? And I, I think the main question for everybody, for all of us is, is how much of a priority is this versus other options in trade? And the biggest one potentially is, as Eric said, there's paper, right? So we, we're talking about, you know, visibility is one thing. And I said, the other twin is around turnaround times and processing. If you can get rid of that paper, can you cut days, days off of the processing, right? And, and so there's lots of industry efforts to, to look at that paper problem. The other one is maybe risk and control, right? Trying to combat fraud. That's a whole nother big, you know, priority and use case. And then, you, you know, you, you have, you have all, all of these priorities and then you also have this uh, tracking. Is, is tracking really must have in that list? Is it a nice to have, is it a should have? Um, and so on. I think, I think it's worthwhile, maybe Andre, your last question, could ITFA or another industry body become a catalyst? Mm -hmm. I think, I think there's, I think it, 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 it's worthwhile to debate, to see in, in an understand phase, right? I think what would be really cool is if ITFA did some kind of a survey 
uh, across the board to just get a sense of what are the different you know, options available and uh, in terms of things to prioritize, how does visibility and control sit versus other potential benefits in, in what we could do as an industry to change trade? Uh, how does that rank? That could be quite interesting. Yes, and, and indeed, there is no, uh, no need for a, an interbank tracking in order to deliver visibility and control to, to your clients. Uh, the, the bank to bank piece uh, is important in payments. Clearly, it is not as important in trade, we see. And uh, however, offering visibility to clients uh, can be achieved on a, an individual basis, bank per bank, as you did at Lloyd's uh, with your trade transaction tracker. And I know some large, uh, other large uh, trade banks have done the same. And indeed, the value in, uh, in, in trade is more at internal tracking level than at cross institution level so that each bank can offer its uh, its own uh, trade tracker over time combined with payments of course because payments are key to the trade process uh, and there, there is no need no uh, uh, and and we validate this here with the discussion for uh, an interbank uh, tracking because trade flows are mainly corporate to bank flows. They are, the, the interbank piece is limited, as you said, to Marisa, to the indirect guarantees uh, so, and DLCs, of course, uh, but uh, low hanging fruit is really between the corporate and the bank and the visibility that uh, new technologies like TradeStream, Intix, and other technologies digitizing the internal process uh, can offer to, to, the, to the clients via mobile, uh, as you have shown. So I don't think indeed there is a need for a GPI for trade, uh, but uh, there is a possibility for banks definitely to increase visibility and control uh, with technologies uh, like Intix and TradeStream uh, with, uh, with no need for a, a GPI for trade. And I like what Casimir said about the MVP. Basically what we launched with Trade Tracker, that is the MVP, right? We took six months to develop it and we said, look, we have to get something out there that customers can use and we keep listening to them. So they will tell us, we like this. They will ask us, can we have this? And it's all in our backlog as well. Uh, if, we, if we try to get the perfect bells and whistles and take two years to do it, then um, you know, that, that we wouldn't have had, you know, given the clients quick, quick enough benefit for that as well. So it really, I support that kind of a, a process. And, um, and I think um, on, on, on that note, it's important that we all look back to, uh, to where we said where really trade and payments are very different in terms, of, uh, in terms of the volume that is being processed, but also in terms of the life cycle of the transaction, right? Uh, let alone, of course, what we've already covered a few, um, a few times to, um, during this session today, that of course, trade also is inherently a lot more paper-based and a lot more transaction by transaction than, uh, than a payment transaction is. And those are certainly some of the challenges that, um, that we as an industry continue to address and where I can see, for example, where solutions uh, like the ones we're seeing from, uh, from TradeStream, for example, can be, um, can be extremely helpful by, um, by really helping with this pre-validation, for example. And, and as Andre said earlier, use really from a uh, really have a control use case, not just a tracking use case, but um, but really look at that as well. Um, and there's a lot of food for thought, um, I think, here in, in that respect. Um, I'm conscious of time, and we have a question from the audience, which I would like to um, to, to get anyone's thought on who, uh, who's got first thoughts on it. Um, and that's from um, from uh, James Glatsky. Um, and, uh, and he's uh, saying, well, regarding trade, when, when does transparency conflict with the desire for confidentiality. And, um, and I want to add maybe to that question, um, because I think it's a very important question. I would, I would like to add to that something that Marissa has just mentioned earlier, where, um, where we are seeing also a, 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 obviously a strong desire within trade to collect data and, and to track to um, prevent fraud. Um, and one thing that we're certainly seeing in that space is um, is a big push to have central registries um, that will then allow to register transactions and therefore, for example, avoid double financing or avoid the financing of goods actually that, um, that, that don't exist as such under this letter of credit. Um, so again, um, on the view of, yeah, where, where does transparency end and where does 
confidentiality start or vice versa and uh, also against the backdrop of how can we actually use certain uh, certain tracking tools and certain data collection um, uh, options to um, to prevent uh, fraud better in trade um, keen to hear the panelists um, thoughts yeah maybe I can start there uh, because I think that's an interesting question as you can see and I think there's no one or the other so there will be different jobs to be done and different solutions for each right so we, you, you know from the trade tracker there's no need to log in but then what kind of information are you going to get just a, a simple status you're not going to get any confidential information, you're not gonna get the beneficiary name or so on, because that job to be done is just tell me where you are and let me easily follow up maybe with an extra question and it's linked. I think if we move away from focus on a platform and everything is on that platform and you know I start with my product, it's a platform and everybody needs to join or, or so on. No, you go to the, the use case, the jobs to be done and there'll be different ones. There'll be a different job to be done where it's not as simple as just tell me where you are but the, the, the user really, the, the, the corporate really wants to know more information. And then obviously that's not gonna be the trade tracker. It will be something else where the experience is good for that job to be done uh, and a kind of different tool. So I see like, you know, like a, a kind of different toolkits uh, that could potentially be used um, to address the different, different jobs. Thank you, Marissa. Um, any of the other panelists wanna add uh, um, anything to that? No, that's um, that's great. Um, I can't see more questions on the chat function right now. Um, and as I say, I'm I'm conscious of time. I, I just um, uh, I just would like to um, to sort of like come back to one point, maybe if I may, um, that Kazimir made, which was uh, we we spoke several times about the the uh, need to access to um, to open APIs. Um, um, I'm just uh, very conscious that that I think is still something that. Again, in the trade space, we probably just haven't seen as much as, as in, in sort of like the payment space, especially, I mean, uh, for people in the UK who are familiar with open banking, um, open APIs over there in, in sort of like a retail consumer space uh, is sort of like it, it, it's, it's, it's an imperative and therefore it's something that has been moving along quite nicely. Um, but I, um, I think other parts of the industry are certainly still sort of like playing catch up and just keen to hear everyone's thoughts, how we can a really enable that that access to open APIs from a trade finance perspective. Well, I'd like to say something on that. Uh, first of all, from our system, everything is open APIs, and we supply all our customers with the APIs. And uh, we think that that has to be the ba basis for communications. Um, the issues are it depends on the bank side or the corporate side. Uh, are they open to uh, APIs? Some would have more modern systems are. Others, it's more complicated for them. But definitely APIs are the way to go. And if you have the APIs, then the communication channels and the transfer of data, et cetera, it becomes very simple and easily done. And uh, it has to be the basis going forward. You don't want to go into at least an area in these areas into big implementation or integration or interface projects. So, uh, and you see more and more banks are heading that way now. And corporates are usually more down that road as it is they're much more advanced in the API area. Right. Thank you, Mosin. Yeah. Anyone I would, else? I would, echo, I would echo that and I would add further that in the trade space, um, it, it is, I think that the challenge uh, in trade is about standards, right? So you luckily have, you know, the, the ICC trade digitization group and, and the DSI and all of those. I think they're starting with the use case of guarantees, trying to define the standards for API so that we can at least have that, which you see in the payment space and it's, it's not yet there as standard you know, uh, as it is. However, uh, there are use cases uh, as well, like Morsha said, um, we would never have been able to develop Trade Tracker if not for API, right? That, that's how you get it built within within six months. Um, so it, as a technology, it's definitely there, it's, it's there to use. Uh, I think uh, when, when it comes to at the industry level, I think standardization is, is, is really required on the trade side. Yes, I'd like to, to add indeed on, on payments, and it would be the same on trade. The way banks use Intix is really uh, in an invisible way to the end customer. The end customer doesn't see it. The end customer gets the info they need. And, and the data technology uh, of Intix uh, is actually purely internal uh, to, to make sure that uh, the, the dozens of back office systems that the large banks are using 
and middleware and, and interfaces and so on are actually uh, all uh, delivering data to, to the right, to, to a common platform that then can be accessed by e-banking portals uh, via APIs. So the API is an internal story within the bank between the, the standard API, uh, the, sorry, the standard uh, e-banking that the bank has chosen since uh, a decade or so. And, and Intix will actually make sure that the, the data from a, uh, an Oracle database, a DB2 database for payments, for trade, for compliance, is actually getting into the e-banking uh, front end uh, in, in, uh, in the right way, uh, but it doesn't have to be to be seen. And that's where I'm insisting that tracking is a, is a, a competitive story now for banks. There is no need for uh, uh, too much interbank work necessarily for banks to get started and to offer tracking to their clients on, on, on various flows, basically. And uh, there is no need for banks to externalize data to a third party, because that shouldn't be done, actually. You should always avoid externalizing data. You should keep that uh, to yourselves uh, under your control. And those technologies, whether it's index for, for data management or trade stream for, for doc checking, are getting embedded. Uh, via APIs, or via file sharing, different interfaces, so that uh, you can deliver more to your clients. Uh, but uh, uh, basically, the uh, the integration into your existing systems uh, is is the key here. So, and of course, once banks want a, an interbank uh, exchange of information, a standardization is is preferable, and that's which GPI has scored for sure. Uh, but in trade, as the, the tracking story is more a, a corporate to bank uh, use case than an interbank use case, uh, banks can get started on the competitive track with no need for collaboration track to, to start with. Thank you. That's great, Andre. Casimir? Yes, I mean, just to, to wrap up and to, to say um, the, the technology is there. Um, the APIs are there most of the time and they are open in as such as they can be used by an external player. Uh, now there is no global standardization uh, in the trade finance world around these APIs. So there's just a question of wording in terms of what is an open API. So that they are APIs, they are open, but there is not no open API standard on trade finance uh, as such. And it likely won't be. Yeah, and the way the way Intix uh, gets achieves this is by going straight to the uh, the database. Yeah. So Intix will not need an API from China Systems, Shortcomp, or Finastra. It could use it. It could use it, but uh, if those APIs are are too limited, not available, uh, the Intix data technology will go a few layers uh, below in the in the database itself. And with the embedded intelligence on, on formats, on semantics, uh, the, the flows, whether it's an MT103 or 700 or 202, will be recognized, or an ISO 2022, will be recognized uh, natively. And that is a way, basically, uh, technology has evolved to address all possible uh, uh, um, obstacles. Uh, no API, fine, uh, we go on, we go to the data layer and, and we get the data that uh, has to be uh, uh, retrieved and tracked. Uh, and that uh, is also open to very old uh, database systems like DB2, uh, uh, which is uh, a few decades old, uh, but still running in, in many banks. So um, indeed the technologies have evolved so much, uh, certainly in data and AI, that uh, all of those technical issues can be resolved at institution level. Uh, uh, and of course, if the industry decides to move on to more standardization, those will be taken over, but it's not a prerequisite for, for, for the data technologies and the AI technologies to, to be working. Great. Thank you. Um, that's, um, I, I think this brings today's session, uh, unfortunately, to a close because I think we, we could still go on for, <laughs> for a number of hours. Um, I just want to thank you all again, Eric, Marissa, Casimir, Mose and Andre, um, for your great contribution, as well, of course, the, um, the audience um, for, um, for attending today's sessions and for the questions asked. Um, I hope you found it 
helpful. Um, I know as always this this video will be um, the, the video of this um, of this webinar will be available on the uh, ITFA website. Uh, and on that note, thanks again once more to uh, to the um, to the website sponsors, um, LFC, uh, Sullivan, uh, Willis Towers, Watson, AIG, and Swiss Re. Um, really appreciate it on that. Um, I'd say certainly key takeaway for me today is, um, and and we've we've already heard the summary query well from the panelists, so I'm not going to try and replicate it. But key takeaway certainly is um, there's some very very useful innovation that has happened in the in the payment space um, that has really added a real value for clients um, and that made transactions a, a lot um, a lot easier. Um, and why we are saying that we don't need a, a swift GPI for trade as such, we certainly do need um, tracking technology and, and various banks are working on, on various systems in that respect. Um, and, uh, and hopefully from there we'll, we'll go further in terms of like, for example, um, enable a better, um, better controls, uh, be that a pre-validation pre check. Um, on a letter of credit or um, will be that really just again in terms of like tracking where in the cycle is is my transaction so um yeah thank you once again um uh, i'll um, i'll leave it at that um great participation from from the panelists and uh, really thank you for your insights and thanks again to the audience for uh for attending today thank you joe thank, thank you. you thank you everyone bye 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 all right, bye-bye. Thank you.